John chapter number 3 and verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do the miracles thou doest except God be with him. Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now the new birth is altogether essential. A man told me this afternoon, he said he had talked with a man this past week who told him that um, uh, the new birth is not the issue, it's religion, stupid. And folks, let me tell you something, religion is your enemy. Religion is not the issue, folks, it's the new birth. And if you haven't been born again, then you're, full, you're part of a world that is full of religion and knows nothing of the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. John's gospel is different from every gospel uh, from all of the other three. This is why that it is called uh, one, not one of the synoptic gospels. Matthew, Mark, and Luke are different. The reason they're different in the sense that um, they deal with the life of the Lord Jesus, so does John. Matthew, Mark, and Luke, uh, they call the synoptic gospels because they record things that John doesn't. But John deals with the deity of Jesus Christ and exalts him in such a fashion as to present to you the bread of life, the one that uh, who came to die that you could be saved. He's the water of life, the bread of life, the word of life. All these titles are given in the Gospel of John. And John records a unique affair here in chapter number 2 and verse 1. It's called A Marriage in Cana of Galilee. Turn there, please, and read it with me. John chapter 2 and verse 1. The third day there was a marriage in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. And both Jesus and both Jesus was called and his disciples to the marriage. When they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus saith unto them, They have no wine. Jesus saith to her, Woman, what have I to do with thee? Mine hour is not yet come. And of course, I'm not going to read the rest of the passage to you tonight. You're certainly familiar with the story of the changing of the water into wine. This is, a, this is a Jewish wedding ceremony. Now, in the pagan world, they have no such thing. The pagan world today is doing away with marriage as fast as they can. Over 50% of all marriages are ending in divorce. Just the other day, two sodomites tied the knot, knot out there in California, and it married it. But, of course, the, the laws of the United States of America still do not recognize the union of two homosexuals together. It's a very particular thing, though, because the state of Hawaii may make that legal, and if they do, it's going to sweep across this country, and these so-called homosexual marriages will receive the same validation in every state as a heterosexual, genuine marriage of a husband and a wife. So therefore, the pagan community has perverted, distorted, and contorted the truth as, it, as much as it can. If you'll read Romans chapter number 1 when you get home tonight, read it very carefully. You'll see how that men were with men, uh, doing that which is unseemingly, and so were women with women. And the Bible says, receiving in their bodies that recompense of their error, which was me. They turned the truth of God into a lie and worshiped the creature more than the Creator who is blessed forever. Amen. But not so with the Jew. In the Old Testament, God ordained that a family unit was altogether necessary for this earth to survive. Without the family unit, we're in a mess, folks. And you know what's happening now. They're telling us that a super predator race is coming on the scene. Young men, young men, who now are five and ten years of age, will blow your brains out, and they don't care. They have no father, and they have no God. These young men are coming up, and these are called super predators, and now the media is beginning to warn us about it. I'd like to look them square in the eye and say, you ought to take the responsibility. You ought to thank yourself for the mess we're in. When you kicked prayer out of school in the 60s, you made it, you made it illegal to, take the, to go into the, these schools in a country and preach the Word of God to the young men and young women, you are responsible for the mess we're in. They wouldn't accept that. Just the other day, they, 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 uh, they did a mother and father for what their son had done and fined them, and now they're going to have to pay something like fifty-five or $60,000 for their boy to be incarcerated for a year in a penal institution. This mother and father are being prosecuted for what their child done. You say, well, preacher... What's wrong with that? Well, let me tell you what's wrong. If you try to discipline your child and some long-tongued thing that lives next door to you called the Department of Welfare, whoever it is, Human Services, they can take your child away from you just that. You can't do a thing about it. And if you try to stop them, they'll throw you in jail. 
In other words, if you try to discipline your child, you are in a straitjacket. You can't do it. They are creating a chaotic situation in this country that is destroying the fiber of the home. And when they get that done, America goes down the tubes. Not so in the, pagan, in, in, not so in the Old Testament Hebrew world. God ordained the family unit, the mother, the father, the husband, the wife, the son, the daughter. All of these relationships are biblical relationships. Once you cross over the barrier of these relationships, you get, into, you get into incest, you get into all kinds of perversion, and God condemns it in His Word. Now, there's a beautiful picture in the Scriptures of the bride of Jesus Christ and of the wife of Jehovah. Now, I'm going to preach that tonight. I'm talking about the bride of Jesus Christ. We'll save the wife of Jehovah for another meeting sometime in the future if we're still around. If we haven't heard a shout between now and then, if we do, we'll let the Antichrist take it up while he's here. Amen. The bride of Jesus Christ, born again saints of God. John chapter 2 talks about a wedding, a wedding, a Jewish wedding. Now, what is a wedding, preacher? I mean, after all, does the preacher stand up before the people and pronounce them husband and wife? Is that when they come become husband and wife before God? Well, I'm going to tell you something. Ceremonies have differed throughout the ages. They, they differ from one culture to the other, from one country to the other. Ceremonies come in all kinds of shape, size, and forms. Pagan world has no ceremony. Pagan goes out and takes the woman that he wants, and she becomes his wife. When he gets through with her, he throws her to the side and takes another woman. He gets through with her, he throws her down like a used piece of junk and finds him another woman. And this is exactly how the pagan world lives. God says you're not going to get away with that. God says you're going to bind yourself to a woman. God says you're going to, you're going to be obligated to that woman. God says that you're going to take that woman, you're going to openly, publicly profess and proclaim that that woman is your wife. When a young Hebrew male in the Old Testament set his eyes upon a woman to become his wife, he immediately set about to see to the father's request, to request the father that this young lady would be his wife. Now, not always the case. Sometimes the father would seek out a bride for his son, and he would, uh, he would call in an intermediary, an individual whose character was above reproach, an individual that he could completely trust to go out and find a bride for his son. This is exactly what happened in the case of Isaac. Abraham sent a servant off into another land to find a bride for his son Isaac and said, by no means take of these women or the women of the Canaanites for my son. And of course, the servant is a type of the Holy Spirit. So God the Father has sent the Spirit into this world today and he trusts his integrity is above reproach and he's going out to find a bride for his son. And so therefore, in the Old Testament, it's honorable because this is made openly and publicly. Once the bride has been established to be the new bride, it is announced publicly for witnesses that this young lady is to become the bride of this young man. This we therefore enter into what's called the betrothal stage. The betrothal, one to another. She begins to wear a veil from that day on. This veil represents the fact that she has been spoken for. And all the men, when they see this, are to understand that she belongs to someone else. Now, when this young man takes this young lady to be his espoused wife, he pays a price for her. He pays as much as he can afford. He pays a very supreme price for her. And when he pays this price, what he's saying to the father is that I put high esteem in her, and I'm willing to give everything that I can possibly afford to purchase this dear to well, not purchase her, but to give a dowry, to replace her in your home because of the, of the farms and so forth. He I says, I'm going to give you this money. I'm going to give you this precious thing so that this is my security. This is my guarantee that she becomes my bride. And that's a wonderful thing because that's a beautiful picture of how the Lord Jesus Christ was sought out, sought out us, and he paid a price for us to the Father. He gave himself upon the cross and shed his precious blood. He gave everything that heaven had to offer so that we would be the bride of Christ. He bought us and he paid for us. And so therefore, we wear the veil from this world. We look through a glass darkly. One day we'll see face to face, that Bible says. When Moses saw him in the Old Testament. He saw him on the top of that mountain, came down, and his face was glowing. They was not. They didn't know. He didn't know his face was glowing. They did. He didn't. But he had the glory of God all over him. The church of Jesus Christ today is in this world, and we are bearing the glory of God. But it is veiled. 
It is not let loose. It's restrained. There's a, there's a holding influence. Like the service we had this morning when people began to rejoice in God, there's a restraining. There's something that even though we turn loose as much as we can, it holds us back. My friend, the day is going to come when the gates swing open wide and we enter the land of glory. And in that land, my friend, that is fairer than day, there'll be no holding back. There'll be no restraining. There'll be none of the kind. When we come before him, we'll worship him with perfect praise. Amen. We'll glorify his holy name. Now, this marriage, this betrothal phase, was the time when the bride had been chosen, set aside. She was marked, and she'd been bought with a price. She wore the veil over her face. Therefore, all that saw her knew that she belonged to a young man who was going to go away now. Once he'd established her to be his bride and betrothed to her, he would go away and prepare a home for themselves, a kupa or a kupa in Hebrew. He'd go away to prepare this, and usually he prepared this at his father's house. In other words, he built onto it. If you go up to Amish land, you'll know what I'm talking about because some of those houses up there have been added to so many times that you can see the part that was built in the 20s, the part that was built in the 40s, the part that was built in the 60s, the part that was built in the 80s, and all that, and they just keep building on to it because they're adding the family, you see. And so when the son goes away, he goes away to build a place for his bride. John chapter 14, he said, I go to prepare a place for you. But if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. These Jews knew full well what he meant when he went away to prepare this place. Now, when he first chose that bride and this Holy Spirit went out and called her and said, Will you be the bride of my, of my master's son? He offered her, according to Jewish tradition, a cup of wine. And it would be up to her to receive that cup of wine and drink it. If she drank that cup of wine, then she would be saying by that that I have accepted this. I am, yes, I will be the bride of the groom. The Lord Jesus Christ sat down that night for the Passover with his disciples gathered around him. He took the cup and he turned it and poured it and he handed it to them and he said, this is the cup of the New Testament of my blood which is shed for you. Now listen carefully. If you pick up a Greek New Testament, it will say hakene diatheke. All that simply means in Greek is the new covenant. Ha is the article, kene is new, diatheke is covenant. But that word diatheke can be translated covenant or testament. Either way, it is translated interchangeably in the New Testament. When he sat down with his bride, he, they drank the wine which represented his blood. Because in the Old Testament, God Almighty, when he joined two together, he considered it a blood covenant. He considered marriage as a covenant. It's not just exchanging of vows and giving of, of sweet platitudes. Marriage, according to God, is a blood covenant. It is the joining together of two people. It is the, it is the intermingling and the mixing of the very soul and being of these two people. God said these two should become one. So therefore, this blood is representative not only of the fact that it is a covenant, but is representative of the very union that takes place. So the Lord Jesus Christ, instead of saying, this is the new covenant of my blood, which a lot of the new Bibles try to translate DFAK and, and, and change the meaning of it, he said, this is the New Testament of my blood. And I've told you so many times before, what does testament mean? What does it mean? A testament is given by someone who is going to die and bequeath to you something. The Bible said in the book of Hebrews chapter 9, without the death, of the testator, the testament is not in force. What is the testament? This is the New Testament in my blood which is shed for you. In other words, bride, will you accept this cup at my hand? And by accepting this cup, you are saying, yes, I will be your bride. Yes, we will become one. And I'll ask you this tonight. Have you accepted that cup tonight? You say, on the preacher, how do I take that cup? You accept the blood covenant of Jesus Christ and his bride by putting faith in the blood, by trusting the blood, by pleading the blood, by knowing that nothing but the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, washes your sins away. It is not your righteousness, your goodness, your birth, your pedigree. It is the blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, or there's nothing. We're either washed in the blood of Jesus Christ or we carry our sins to hell. It's the, uh, no other way, no other choice. Either the blood is applied, or there's no covenant. So therefore, the Hebrew word in the Old Testament, literally for covenant, means to cut covenant. 
A covenant was not a covenant unless it was cut. What do you cut? That flesh. What happens when you cut flesh? It bleeds. So blood was involved in every single one of them. So now we have a bride who's been chosen by a reputable one, wears a veil. She's been bought and paid for. She's been given a promise and gifts. This young man, before he goes away to this bride-to-be, that is betrothed, will give her gifts. He not only buys, pays, uh, pays for her, but he gives her gifts. He gives her gifts to show his love for her and as a guarantee that he's coming back again for her. Well, now the Lord Jesus Christ, when he went to heaven, the Bible said he gave gifts to men. He gave gifts to all of us. You say, I don't have a gift. Yes, you do. You're just too stubborn to let God use it. Amen. You sure do. Well, I know most of you got the gift of the tongue. I realize that. The amazing thing to me is how that the smallest, one of the smallest members of the body, so flexible, becomes so powerful. And it's an amazing thing to me also how that a thing like that is a mark of true spirituality. I don't buy it. I don't buy it. Don't believe it. I don't accept it. There's a whole lot more to being spiritual than la la la. You better believe it. A whole lot more. A whole lot more. Although there are people who do speak in tongues that I believe are good people that love the Lord. And this is not a blanket condemnation of them. But I want to tell you this right now. Don't ever be intimidated by somebody to tell you that if you can wag your tongue that that's a sign that you're full of the Holy Spirit of God. No, sir, my friend. No, sir. Another thing that she would do before the bride left, the bridegroom left, was this. She would take a cleansing bath. She would go into what's called a mikvah. Jewish mikvah is just exactly like this here. If you go to Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, you'll find where archaeologists have uncovered mikvahs. They are literally sister, like a little cistern where water is, water is poured in, and the individual goes down into that water, and they are cleansed ceremonially from their sins, and they come up clean, and they're able then to go to the top of Mount Zion, and there offer sacrifices, praise, and worship to God. That's a wonderful thing. And so the Campbellite says, you see, when you go into this baptismal pool, you contact the blood. When you come out of there, you're truly clean and you're saved by the grace of God. Until that happens, you're not saved. Sorry, that's, you're dead wrong. The moment that you accept Jesus Christ and you take that cup and you take that blood and you say, yes, I will be, a, I will be the bride of Christ. This blood will wash my sins. What are you saying? You are saying that the death of Jesus Christ on the cross is absolutely, completely sufficient to wash my sins away. That's good enough. If you're willing to do that, that blood cleanses your sins, and from that moment on, you're a child of God. All you're doing here is ceremonially, and that's all it is. You are ceremonially proclaiming to the world that I'm identifying myself with a son of God who went into the watery grave at Jordan, who came up and let this be a witness of righteousness that I'm doing the same thing that he did. In other words, this is in type what has already ha happened to me inside my soul. This is showing you outwardly what has taken place inwardly. I go into the baptismal pool to show you how that the water covers me. I go under the water. When I come up out of that water, I come into newness of life figuratively and symbolically. My friend, I'm going to tell you right now, thanks be unto God. 1973, I went under the blood, and when I came up from that place, I walked in newness of life. And the way the bridegroom goes, said bye to his espoused bride. She doesn't know how long he's going to be gone. No one knows how long he's going to be gone. He doesn't know how long he's going to be gone. But he said, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I go, I will come again. Receiving of myself there where I am, there you may be also, and away he goes. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus did. He said, I go, John 14, and he left. And he's in the presence of God now, preparing a place for us. Now listen carefully. He said, in my father's house there are many mansions. If it were not told, I would have, were not so, I would have told you. Is that correct? That's what my King James Bible says. Well, it was the, it was the custom of the young man to go build onto his father's house. Uh, upon the, to where his father was to, to begin to build. Well, if you read in Revelation chapter number 19, you'll read a new Jerusalem that comes down from God out of heaven. It's literally the Lamb's bride. Amen. Now, this new Jerusalem is 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles that way, and 1,500 miles that way. The new Jerusalem is a perfect cube. If you laid the New Jerusalem down on the boundaries of the United States of America, it would stretch all the way from Florida to Kansas. 
it would stretch all the way halfway across the continental United States. You say that's big. You didn't get the picture. That's just the flat of it. It goes up 1,500 miles. In plainer words, multiply what you've got from Florida to Kansas times 1,500. And you begin to get an idea of how big the New Jerusalem is. 1,500 miles this way, that way, and that way, a cube. You know what a cube is. A cube is an, is an enormous container because we're talking about something that's huge in size. I'm so glad that the bride of Jesus Christ is not made up of one or two. Lord bless us too and no more. You know, we're, we're the bride of Christ. The Baptist briders have always believed that. They believe they're the only ones that, uh, that's the body, of, the body of Christ. The rest of them are friends of the bridegroom. Are they in for a shock? Amen. That's the bride of Jesus Christ. Now he said, if I go, I will come again. Now he's in heaven. He's waiting, preparing. He's getting ready to come again. Now one of the strange things about this Jewish wedding was that the, the bride would set about her affairs and she would be ready. She would be waiting. As a matter of fact, they say that she'd keep a candle by her bed and she must keep oil there so the candle would burn. She'd be waiting. At any moment, she does not know when, he is going to come and get her. It may be in the morning, it may be in the afternoon, it may be at night while she's asleep. He is going to come. And when he comes, he's going to come immediately. He's not going to announce it and go through a big long thing. He's just going to come and get her. Now this is what happened. They say that sometimes at midnight, not all at the same time, but sometimes at midnight, the bridegroom, bride, bridegroom with his procession would come down the street He'd go directly to the house, go up to the door. He'd go right in to where his bride was waiting, go right in there and take her and be gone. He didn't announce it, say goodbye to anyone, anything. He was, took his bride and he left. Now, that's exactly what the Lord's going to do. He said, if I go, I'll come again to receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. When he comes, he's not asking anyone permission of anything. He's coming to catch up to meet him in the clouds. Sometime he'd come in the afternoon, sometimes in the morning. But come he will and take his bride to be with him. Now what happens then? Well, the marriage is consummated. He takes his bride to be with him. We've entered the wedding phase. Now first we have the betrothal phase. That's where we are now. We're in the betrothal phase. The next phase will be the wedding phase. When he comes to catch us up to be with him, we'll go to the judgment seat of Christ. The church of Jesus Christ is going to go up and we're going to stand to beam and be judged for our works. We're going to be judged for our stewardship and our faithfulness to the Lord Jesus Christ. He's going to judge all of us, give us rewards, so forth and so on. Then we come back down to planet Earth. When we come back down to planet Earth, we come back down to do battle. We'll be doing battle at the Battle of Armageddon. Us, preacher? Yes. If you'll read the book of Joel very carefully, he's got an army with him. And that army that comes out of the heavens, that army that comes down from above, are the sons of God. You will have a glorified body incapable of death. You'll be coming back. What for? To prepare the place for the met, for the wedding feast. It's time to celebrate. Once the marriage is consummated, we come back. Now when we come back, the battle, the battle is engaged and the enemy's put down. And then when this takes place and all is ready, Lord Jesus Christ sits down on this earth, the marriage supper of the Lamb. Turn to Revelation 19. And that'll pick us up here. In Revelation chapter number 19 and verse 7 says this. Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him. For the marriage of the Lamb is come, and his wife hath made herself ready. Who's that? Who's the wife of the Lamb? It's us. Made ourselves ready. Yes, watch carefully as we read. Hath made herself ready. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen clean and white for the fine linen watch this carefully is the righteousness of saints and he saith unto me right blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the lamb he saith unto me these are the true sayings of god now when we read psalm chapter 45 we find a whole lot of people invited to the marriage supper of the lamb great deal we find old testament gentiles before the law we find Old Testament Jews under the law. We find Old Testament Gentiles under the law. We find tribulation saints because they have gone through great tribulation, washed their robes, made them white in the blood of the Lamb. We also find Jews who came out of the great tribulation 
And then of all, above all, and separate from any of the rest of them, the apple of his eye, his darling, his one, we find the bride of Jesus Christ. Who's that? That's us. This is our day. When the Lord Jesus comes back, folks, and sits down, and we sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb, this is the celebration phase of the marriage. First is the espousal. Secondly is the consummation of the marriage. And then thirdly is the celebration phase. We begin to celebrate. We sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. If you'll notice what it says in verse 8, it says that to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white, for the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. This is quite a twist if you want to think on this tonight. The Bible said one came to the wedding, did not have a wedding garment on. He had to flee. Another one came to the wedding and was naked. Literally didn't have anything to wear. If you think about this, you're talking about us coming to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And what we have on is the righteousness of the saints. Now you can do good deeds. The Bible said in Ephesians chapter 2 that you are created in Christ Jesus unto good works. There is literally something you do once you get saved by the grace of God. There is a righteousness that is involved in your life. Now the righteousness that gets me saved is the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. Don't ever forget that. No man can ever work his way into heaven. You can never be good enough. Your righteousness is as a filthy rag, Isaiah said, in the sight of God. So our righteousness that justifies us before a holy God, and he says it's just as if you'd never sinned, it's standing in state before him, is the righteousness of Jesus Christ, the blood covenant that's applied to us. Once you get saved by the grace of God, folks, it's not all sweet cream from then on. You can't just live any way you want to. You can't play games with God and just come and go as you please and do as you please and become master of your life. You see, the sad thing is a lot of people think, well, God, I've, 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 I've skated. I mean, I've made it. I know I'm saved. I know, I know, I know, I know. I got saved by the grace of God, and here I am. I, my time's about up. I'm about ready to go, and I got by with a few things. Remember this. You're going to go to the judgment seat of Christ, number one. And number two, you're going to have to sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And according to what I read in here in Revelation chapter number 19, when you sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb, the garments you have on are going to display very clearly the kind of life you lived after you got saved. It's the righteousness of the saints. It's what life you live for the Lord Jesus Christ. What kind of life did you live for him? I mean, after all, are you a good steward of Jesus Christ? Are you a disciple? He said, you, if you don't take up your cross every day and follow me, you can't be my disciples. He said, let a man deny himself. He said, if you abide in the vine and the, and the vine, and vine abide in you, the word abide in you, he said, you can ask what you will, and I'll do it. But he said, without the vine, without me, you can do nothing. You swivel up and die. We need to understand and learn one of the greatest truths there is. What's that, preacher? Paul said that I might know him in the power of his resurrection. Somehow or another, I might learn this mystical idea of being plugged into Jesus Christ and draw all my sustenance and strength from him. I've got to learn that. Or else I set about with good works and good deeds, which is nothing in the world more than hay, wood, and stubble that's going to burn up, and it's no good. The righteousness of the saints. One day we're going to sit at the judgment seat of Christ, and we're going to stand at the judgment, be a judge, and then sit at the marriage supper of the Lamb, and there they are. There's Abraham, there's Isaac, there's Jacob, there's Noah, there's Moses, Joshua. All of them are there. Caleb. You know Caleb, the one who came back and said, oh, I know, they're, I know they gave an evil report. Let me tell you something. Caleb said, we can take the land. We can, Caleb said. You know what happened? Caleb took the land. Caleb took the land. He lived to be an old man. And God gave him a portion in the land. He gave the others graves in the wilderness. Yes, it makes a big deal about how we live for the Lord. You see, the marriage supper of the Lamb is only the beginning of the celebration phase. When we go into the millennium, we, the church of God, us, the bride of Christ, will have glorified bodies. I, the glory that Adam had is looked like a, a tar pit compared to the glory we're going to have. Adam had some glory. But we're going to have the glory of God shining all over, over us. We are going to have sons of God reigning with him for a thousand years. We've entered into the celebration phase. He gathers his bride with him and we celebrate for a thousand years. The New Jerusalem, listen carefully has foundations of the apostles. Gates, peril. Everything in the New Jerusalem tells me that when the Gentiles on this earth during the millennium, during the, during the time to follow, 
come up into that new Jerusalem, they are going to see the actual lives of all the saints of God for 2,000 years that make up the bride of Christ. You see, the new Jerusalem is a living memorial and testimony to every single one of us. Now, if you go to Jerusalem today and see Yad Vashem, you'll see photographs. You'll see pictures of the people, the Jews who died in the concentration camps. They died at the hands of the monster Hitler. Six million Jews died. The reason they put these photographs on that wall, the reason they make this memorial, is because they do not want you to forget the horrible, horrible carnage that ensued in World War II at the hands of Adolf Hitler, and rightly so, rightly so. Because there's a bunch of reprobates standing up today that deny the Holocaust ever existed. It happened, folks. So the Holocaust remains a memorial to the suffering of the Jewish people. The New Jerusalem is a memorial 2,000 years church history. When you walk through the streets of the New Jerusalem, you'll walk into the midst of the martyrs. You'll be able to sense and feel the burning and the pain and the sorrow they endured at the hands of the Roman Catholic Church and the hands of uh, animals like Henry VIII and Bloody Mary. When you walk through the streets of the New Jerusalem, you'll be able to sense and feel the work of the great missionary effort as it went to the ends of the earth, spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus. You'll be able to feel and sense tribulations that people are going through today, martyrs are being made this very minute in this world to the name of the Lord Jesus. The New Jerusalem is an eternal memorial, a living memorial to the saints of God. We don't have much time left. We don't. Now let me look at it two ways. Way number one, if the Lord Jesus comes back at the rapture, we're going soon. Say he doesn't. I'm still going soon. If the Lord tarries his coming, I'll go the way of all the flesh. How much time do I have left? Say, I've got 10 years. Say, I live to be 60. Say, I've got 20. I live to be 70. Say, for chance, that I live to be 80. That's 30 years. What's that? What can I get done in 30 years? What can I accomplish for the Lord Jesus Christ if I only have 20 years left? I mean, after all, what is your life? It's just a vapor. What are you doing with your life? Think of this. Think of standing at the judgment seat of Christ with no rewards. Think of sitting at the marriage supper of the Lamb. No garments. Think of the New Jerusalem, this eternal memorial to the saints of God. The church. Where are you? Well, you're there. What do they see when they get there? Did you know that if you just gave him the next five years of your life, that you could put something beautiful and eternal in heaven and in that New Jerusalem? You just give him five years of it. Just give him the next five years. Give it to him. Really give him the next five years of your life. He'll give you something at the judgment seat of Christ. He'll say, welcome, sit down at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And when they walk into that new Jerusalem, you'll have a spot there. If you just give him. Listen, if you just gave him the next year of your life, if that's all you had left, if you gave it to him, you could purchase for yourself, and that's what you're doing. You're earning a reward. You could purchase for yourself an eternal inheritance. Fade, not fade away. I think it's worth it. I stand before you tonight and say this, by the grace of God, I don't know how much time I've got left. But whatever, however much time I have left, I am going to dedicate that time to the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm not going to dedicate it to a house, a car, a boat, to clothes, to a bank account to any temporal, physical thing that's going to pass away. It's going to burn, people. I am going to dedicate my life to the Lord Jesus. Now, I know, I know, I realize this. I confess this tonight to you. I've got a head start on you. How do you know? Because God called me to preach. And when I stand up here in the pulpit and preach the Word of God, I don't preach it in... Uh, how do you say it? What would I say? He didn't make me preach. Uh, it's not an anger. Uh, it's not a burden. It's a joy. I've noticed that as my life comes down to the end of its days, how much more joy God gives me in doing the good things of the Lord. I'm privileged, folks. God has been good to me. I'm privileged. 
to be able to stand up here and open up this sacred book. I want to get something at the judgment seat of Christ. The marriage supper of the Lamb in that new Jerusalem. Do you? Do you? He said, if I go, I will come again and receive you to myself. But where I am, there ye may be also. In such an hour as you think not, the Son of Man cometh. Wait, watch, look. Father, in Jesus' name, blessed be Jesus' name. Blessed be his name above every name. That at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow, every tongue should confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. My Father, today I only understand in a small way how proud you are of the name of Jesus. For in that name you have exalt, exalted it above every name. And I understand by that name, that is the name of his earthly humiliation. That is the name that he carried on the cross. That is the name that he as a man bore on this earth. That is a name. That is the name that you gave him. On this earth, show his submission to you. That name was a name of humiliation you have exalted to the highest place of honor in the universe. That at the name of Jesus, not Michael, not Gabriel, but at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow. Lord, when that name is said across the spans of eternity, when that name is said, I want to be there. I want to be standing with God's people. And I want to be in that group that rejoices when we bow the knee to the name of Jesus. If there be one in here with us tonight, my Heavenly Father, who has never bowed the knee to the name of Jesus, and they say they never will bow the knee to the name of Jesus, wake them up, Lord. They'll bow the knee to the name of Jesus, and they'll burn, but they'll still bow and confess that He is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Lord, it would be so much easier for them to do it right now. And come and bow their knee to the name of the Lord Jesus. And instead of giving him lip service and playing games with him when they call him Lord, say Lord from the heart and mean it that he's the Lord. He's the Lord of my life. And everything else takes second place to him. God help us do that tonight. In Jesus' sweet holy name we pray. Amen. Let's stand up and sing. people baptized tonight. Amen. God adds to the church daily such as should be saved. Amen. We cannot produce converts. We can witness. We can be faithful to tell people about the Lord pray for their soul. Amen. But the Lord is the only one that can give the increase. Amen. One souls and other waters, but God gives the increase. Amen. Bless his holy name. What's this mean? It means that God has entrusted to this assembly of believers, to this church, these four souls. Amen. That means that we're to nurture them, to fellowship with them, to pray for them, to help them in their walk with the Lord. Amen. So, well, the next guy will do it. Every one of us should accept that responsibility tonight to go out of our way and encourage them now in their walk with the Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Brother Scott Hooks, please lead us. You thank you, Lord, for this day. We thank you, God, for these folks that have been saved. Yes. We're so thankful, Lord, that you died on the cross, Lord, saved us yes. while we were yet sinners. You loved me. And Lord, yes. I just pray, God, now for these folks, Lord, that you've saved. I pray, Lord, that you'll build them up in the faith. And you'll help us, Lord, to build them up in the faith. We thank you, Lord, for what uh, encouragement and what things they've done for us. And that we see, Lord, that the evidence of their faith. Lord, I pray it would build up our whole church. And Lord, I just pray you'd give us a desire to see many more people saved. And Lord, I pray that many more would be. And I pray, Lord, now for these, to just help them to walk in the faith and, and bless them and strengthen them, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 My sister, because of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Amen.
My brother, because of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. <laughs> My brother, because of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. My brother, because of your faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. 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 Blessed be God. Brother Miller, would you lead us in prayer?